So we're looking at uh, in the background here, uh, and you know, we tell a story in the, the first chapter of the book about uh, competition to be green, and I'll, I'll return to that uh, a little bit. But the Mercedes-Benz Stadium is the lead platinum building, a zero waste certified building. Uh, it uh, is considered the greenest stadium in the world. And uh, so we're telling the story about how projects like that can help change the marketplace. Uh, so a major challenge uh, that we face is what would I say call, or call deep decarbonization and how we transition the, the built environment and specifically buildings to decarbonize. And the built environment is roughly responsible for about 40% of global CO2 emissions. This comes in the form of electricity use, heating, uh, refrigeration, and escaped refrigerants. Uh, as well as materials and life cycle of uh, the, the buildings that you use to construct a building. And buildings have broader sustainability considerations as well. So they're a nice lens to think about sustainability. So they use water and treat water. They, uh, we have indoor air quality, which affects health. Uh, the, it affects our quality of life. There's materials that go into buildings and sometimes toxic materials that go into buildings. Uh, and we, such as PVC piping, which we excluded from uh, the living building at Georgia Tech. Uh, and they are really a point of focus for generating waste and how we do recycling. Uh, a key observation or thought that I and my co-author, uh, Doug Noonan, uh, had on this was that CO2 pricing, so the dominant, the dominant paradigm in environmental economics for the last, I don't know, 50 years has been that if you get the prices right, the market will work it out. Uh, and I think the key observation was that, you know, there's a lot of other market failures permeating this space and that CO2 pricing, even if done correctly, is unlikely to solve many of the other market failures uh, and market barriers that are in the built environment. Uh, we often think uh, in the built environment in particular, we think about uh, energy, energy efficiency, right, which is high subject to a lot of information asymmetry uh, and uh, or imperfect information, which would I would say is a market barrier. So information asymmetry being the market failure, imperfect information maybe being a market barrier. Uh, so there's high transaction costs and search costs, very costly to renovate a building, to find contractors, to figure out what the optimal sort of improvements might be. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty associated with nascent environmental technologies that make them high risk. And so there's high discount rates in the market. And uh, we have a market beset by principal agent problems and, uh, and I mentioned information asymmetry, lots of frictions. And one thing that I learned about the building and construction industry is that uh, the practices, practices themselves are highly localized. Uh, and so knowledge and practices, one of the technologies we learn about uh, called chilled beam HVAC, which is pretty new to Atlanta. Uh, we sort of pioneered it here at Georgia Tech. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. Uh, it's been disseminating throughout Tech Square, and, but it uh, apparently has been in use since the 1970s in some parts of the world, right? So, but it, it you know, part of this is uh, we have unique climate here. We have a lot of heat and humidity. Uh, part of it is that knowledge is, is highly localized in the building and construction space. Uh, so a key intellectual insight of this work that I'll return to at the end is that there's this role of multiple and interacting market failures and that maybe we need multiple policy tools to solve these complex mar market failures and that this sort of idea that we're just going to get the prices right and the market's going to sort it out, it just isn't, isn't going to solve, solve this issue. From a policy perspective, we have the Inflation Reduction Act and Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. And we are throwing lots of subsidies and incentives uh, to nudge certain technologies. Uh, there's money in these bills for pilot and demonstration projects and for grants and for R&D. And so we might want to think about how we structure programs, how we direct programs that help facilitate broader market transformation.
Uh, and so in, in, in a key insight from the, from the, the book I'm about to present is that we can leverage markets and government together uh, to, to accomplish these things. So the motivating example for this book was the Candida Bill. So a number of years ago, I was on a committee. I uh, don't know if anyone in this room is on that committee, but we were asked to brainstorm a building that lives, learns, and teaches, and that could transform the way that building and construction is done in the Southeast. And I said to myself, you know, that last part of that, I think that's a testable hypothesis. And in fact, this isn't the first demonstration project we've ever done. We've attempted these before. Uh, and specifically, USGBC in the uh, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design program, which was launched in the early 1990s, uh, had a goal to, quote, make green building widely accessible within 30 years. Well, it's been 30 years. Good time to assess it. And which is great. In policy, a lot of times people are really trying to jump the gun and assess things before they even like are implemented. Uh, I reviewed a paper about that yesterday. Um, and so, you know, the key research questions here are can eco labeling programs transform markets? What are the mechanisms that enable market transformation? And what are the other supporting policies and strategies that are make this that make this more likely to occur? Uh, so, you know, here at George Tech, probably all familiar with uh, Candida building. Um, watch it uh, get reconstructed. Uh, it made national news. It's a, a certified living building. It's one uh, it's certainly the, considered the greenest building in the southeast. It's one of only maybe a couple dozen of these buildings. So it's definitely a demonstration project and it was built for the purposes of transforming the build, uh, building and construction industry in the Southeast. Georgia Tech was chosen for this building because of our high visibility to give these new technologies credibility. Uh, the uh, contractors who worked on these building and the architects saw this as a loss leader, as a way to gain a, a market advantage into this, uh, into this new market. And uh, it's it's definitely transformational. It's it's not incremental. Uh, it's it's not. It is also LEED Platinum certified, uh, but in many ways, it's it's quite different. All the materials for this building are off the shelf, or all the technologies are off the shelf, uh, done to make it replicable. Uh, so when I when I started thinking about this goal to. to what do we mean by transform the way the building and construction is done in the Southeast? So let's just come up with a simple definition of green market transformation. I've seen a few other competing definitions uh, floating around in the literature, uh, but I want to say we were, I, th I think we're probably the first to use this phrase. Um, when, and I'll say when nascent energy and environmental technologies become common in the market. Uh, so, you know, the idea of market transformation goes back to this vast diffusion curve, this idea that uh, you have a logistic cumulative normal distribution function that describes that you have, you know, technologies that are introduced to the marketplace and they, you know, slowly pick up scene and then you have rapid adoption and then it levels off. So what are some of the micro underpinnings of this curve and how can policymakers, NGOs and other market participants change the shape of this curve? Uh, a similar and related thread is this idea of this valley of death, which a lot of people in the science and technology space are familiar with. And uh, in, in this conceptualization or parable, you have a lot of tech, a uh, lot of effort in basic and applied research, a lot of promising technologies. You probably read about all these fancy new technologies that are about to come on the market, perovskites, uh, advanced cement that absorbs CO2, all kinds of stuff. And you have all this basic and applied research stuff coming out of universities to show up in labs. And then many of them disappear and never become commercialized. And we call this the Valley of Death. Some of them seem to bridge that valley or make it over uh, past that valley. And then we have all these demand pull uh, policies that help pull them along. All these sort of per kilowatt hour solar subsidies and wind subsidies, the capital tax breaks, 
all the, a lot of these market-based instruments, these marginal incentives to induce uh, uptake of new technologies, those are demand pull. And then we have the technology push policies, which are your R&D subsidies and uh, public spending on R&D, a lot of the grants and funding that uh, uh, pushes uh, technological development at universities. But what we're missing is these uh, is, is a set of policies, a set of programs to help bridge that valley, to get these very nascent technologies, these one-off projects that uh, maybe things that have been proven in the lab, how do we get those uh, to have wide uptake in the market? And I'm going to propose that we look at pilot and demonstration projects that take early stage uh, technological development and uh, prove uncertain technologies Maybe we use some other tools like public procurement, which can help build economies of scale. And so there's a number of intellectual underpinnings that I'm going to rely on here, some of which is work that I've done in the past. So eco labels can help induce maybe the adoption of nascent energy and environmental technologies. You get a marketing signal for being the first into this space. You certify platinum, uh, lead platinum, you get bragging rights, and then others want what you have, keeping up with the Joneses. Uh, so you have, so voluntary programs, eco labels are seen to accelerate the diffusion of technologies and practices. Uh, demonstration projects are designed to determine the probability or success, uh, uh, probability of success or failure for broad scale applications of innovative tech. Uh, we have public procurement programs can help pull along private sector adoption. And, uh, and build economies of scale and supply chains. And demonstration projects uh, can help reduce uncertainty by providing learning about uh, new technologies. And so a key insight across all of these papers is that early adopters of technologies provide valuable information to the market. It's a positive information externality that spills over to the rest of the market. And so you see a bunch of supply side effects as a result. Uh, so maybe reduce search costs or procurement costs or design costs or process related transaction costs that might be reduced by building up supply chains, by proving new technologies, uh, by, uh, and then you have demand side effects. So we showcase the reliability and performance of no novel technologies. Many technologies in the building space are what we call experience goods. You don't know how good they are until you use them or are credence goods. You don't even know how good they are after you use them. You have to have somebody tell you how good they are. Uh, you can think of organic produce, right? You don't know that it's organic unless it's labeled organic. That's a credence good. Uh, and so uh, the demand for these sorts of goods can be disseminated through uh, a formal or informal network of interactions. So word of mouth, shared suppliers. Maybe we could rely on uh, conglomerates or firms to spread innovations throughout their supply chain or throughout uh, their multiple locations. Uh, so, uh, shared suppliers, uh, peer effects, right? Keeping up with the Joneses or seeing solar on your house might make you more likely to put, or seeing solar on someone else's house might make you more likely to put solar on your house or seeing somebody with a Tesla makes you want to buy a Tesla. Spicuous conservation, it's called. <laughs> um, so we're going to look in depth at the leadership in energy and environmental design space to test a lot of these uh, hypotheses and theories. Uh, so uh, briefly, USGBC created this. It's a nonprofit created this lead label. We are. It's a multi-dimensional label with five categories. You get a bunch of points. It's a little bit of a what I call choose your own adventure approach to uh, certification. So at least in an initial conception, I think there were 69 points. And if you got 40% of points, you were certified. 50% of points, you were silver. 60% of points, you were gold. And 80% of points, you were platinum. Uh, they've adjusted the numbers over the years. Uh, we're going to rely on uh, 75,000. So for this initial a uh, part of the project that I'm going to talk about, we're going to rely on 75,169 uh, buildings that were registered. Uh, 1,144 of them are considered pilot projects. These took place from 2000 to 2020. 
uh, and they span a bunch of different vintages of lead. So they have lead new construction, lead existing buildings, so that's a retrofit, lead corn shell, which is one of the shell of a building, lead commercial interior, retail new construction, and retail commercial interior. And we're going to use these different vintages for our statistical identification strategy uh, later. Uh, so we started off in this research with an observation that uh, by uh, certifying green, by getting this lead eco label, uh, and being early to the market, you drive additionality into this space. So you see this sort of sawtooth histogram, which would never occur if you didn't have these different certification tiers, right? So what we see going on is people are upgrading at these certification thresholds. They're investing additional resources. You would never do less, but you do additional resources beyond what might be cost efficient from an energy efficiency perspective to get those additional points so that you have additional bragging rights that you can say, hey, I'm extra green, you know, I got, you know, silver, gold, platinum. Um, and so that multi-tier structure that they sort of just stumbled upon, I, I at some point had a conversation with uh, one of the guys who had sort of invented this label. And he's like, oh, you know, we're thinking of it like, um, like grades in the classroom. We want to have A, B, C, and D. Uh, and so they sort of created this sort of choose your own adventure with this multi-tier uh, multi certification. And it has been uh, what we show, it has causal effect uh, using this non-parametric uh, non regression discontinuity design uh, to cause additional uptake around these thresholds. Uh, green building is also a global phenomenon. So LEED is very popular, it's the most popular program throughout the world, but uh, this uh, is a sum of the certified buildings across the 14 most popular eco-label programs. I mentioned, you know, the UK has BREAM, that's the second most popular, uh, but like Australia has one, uh, Hong Kong has one, China has one, India has one, so there are, uh, these things exist uh, throughout the world. And then you have, in, in some, and there's, you know, an interesting research question for the future would be, how do these interact? How do these influence each other? Most of these are multi-tier, copying the lead approach. Uh, but like in China, you have, you know, lead buildings, but then you have the Chinese version of green buildings, which escapes me. This, uh, this graph shows the adoption of uh, the LEED eco-label over time, uh, showing that uh, at least for versions 1.0 to 2.2, you have this clear S-curve. Uh, and then, you know, one thing that's kind of interesting about the LEED label is that they have, uh, you know, continued to introduce new versions kind of restarting what I will call starting the restarting the race. Uh, and so as they introduce new labels, there's slow uptake at first and then they typically take off. This this uh, map shows a lead pilot and demonstration projects in red that we're going to leverage uh, in, a, in a little bit with regular projects in blue relation density in gray, blue gray. Uh, and so what we're, we think that pilot and demonstration projects are going to cause uptake. And, and so a paper that we published in uh, the Journal of Policy Analysis and Management uses something called a triple difference model that I'm not going to go into, but uh, it shows that the presence of a pilot project doubles the uptake of non-pilot lead buildings of the same vintage in a particular zip code in a particular year. So the, the causal story is that you, you, you put a, a, a demonstration project in an area, other people see it, you've built supply chains. We can't really distinguish between the supply and demand side effect here, but you, uh, you've built supply chains, you've lowered the cost for additional, uh, uh, additional people to build a lead building, uh, we see a reduction in cost. We see, I think it's a 7% reduction in the time it takes to build another similar building uh, in the same area. Uh, we also see that government projects and universities, when they 
do uh, pilot projects. It facilitates uptake of uh, private sector uh, projects. Well, one interesting thing we found is that having a lot of pilot projects matters. So as a sort of side, you know, things to think about for the future, the, the Idaho is littered with one off nuclear plants. Uh, I took a tour of Idaho National Labs. It's like this graveyard of demonstration nuclear projects. And, you know, well, why didn't any of these ever gain commercialization? What we found in our paper is the first quintile of demonstration practice reduced the probability of uptake of an additional project. And but you kind of keep chugging away at it. And those like the second, the third and fourth and fifth quintiles really increase the probability of uptake of additional projects. So it's a, you can't just do one of these. You need to do lots of them. Yeah. So were there kind of like a formal platform where uh, the pilot project can share their like experience to the others? Yeah, you actually get points in lead for giving tours. And which people laugh about, but it's actually maybe a really important component. It's this sort of dissemination effect, right? And you have the big sticker that goes on the door. And uh, so, yeah, there's uh, incentives to share. I think part of the pilot project designation is that there's a lot more back and forth with the designers of the project they, uh, and, the, and the lead certifiers. So uh, important components of this. So we can't, we don't study sort of the design of pilot projects across you know, lots of institutional designs of pilot projects, but there does seem to be a number of characteristics of this particular pilot project program, or uh, and actually I'd call them demonstration projects. Lead calls them pilot projects, uh, but they're really designed for external learning. Whereas I think pilot, when I think pilot, I think more internal learning. Uh, but uh, leads calling them pilot, but they're really demonstration projects, and they do. There's a lot more bilateral communication with the certifiers and between the contractors and that sort of stuff to try to make show how these work and to learn from them. So do they have kind of different criteria for pilot project and regular project for evaluation? Uh, not for evaluation, but I think they're getting kind of soft technical assistance and there's a little more back and forth going on during this sort of pilot project phase. So LEED does these pilot projects when they're sort of introducing a new vintage. And so then the first I don't know, X number of these projects, they will label pilot project mm. and they sort of get buy in from the construction organ or the builder uh, to label these a pilot project and work with them to make it work. Mm. Uh, second driver is we, we see this sort of marketing signal that spurs what we call a race to the top. Uh, so uh, the causal story here being that you have uh, this early adoption. It's creating uh, information. Uh, it's creating maybe learning by doing that lowers costs, facilitates uptake. Uh, what we're seeing is that over time, the distribution moves out to the right, meaning that buildings over time get greener. Uh, one thing we thought would happen, and it's, it's not obvious from, from these graphs, uh, we have three sort of panels that I'm looking at at the bottom. Uh, we thought that, you know, over time you would get better and better at sort of hitting those thresholds and that uh, you'd see more and more clustering. Yeah, we don't really see that exactly. We see, in fact, statistically, we actually see a smaller percentage of projects being built right at the thresholds. More of them over comply with the minimum standards for certification. And what we think might be going on there is technology learning, that maybe the value of the signal decreases, the market gets more crowded, but you learn more about the value of the technologies. Maybe you want more daylight for your building because it makes your employees more productive and happier. And even if that's not going to get you to the next certification threshold, you want to do it anyway. Uh, maybe uh, you your employees demand bike racks, so you do the bike racks regardless of whether or not that's going to move you to the next certification threshold. So the key insight here is that at the certification threshold, you have this discontinuous marketing signal, but at the sort of individual points, you have a more continuous quality improvement. 
question. Yeah. Isn't there, there also a possibility of a safety threshold amongst the designers? So the threshold for lead silver is however many points, maybe build in three or four more extra points into the process. Yeah. And, and some of those points don't pan out. Right. That that is um that at least discussions that that's that's what people are doing. They're usually I heard two to three points they're trying to build into the process just in case. Mm -hmm. Um you would think that over time you'd get better mm -hmm. at sort of hitting that. We don't see that. Mm -hmm. Um or what we're, what I think what we're seeing is that people more are just going beyond those two or three just because they want the points. I mean, clearly still, you know, by 2010 to 2012, plenty of companies are just hitting those thresholds, right? But there's, a, it's not everybody, right? There's a fair bit of density uh, sort of between gold and platinum, for example, or between silver and gold. Yeah. Uh, driver number three, uh, and uh, we think is information and knowledge sharing networks. So we talked, uh, there was a question uh, earlier about, you know, disseminating the knowledge about these. And, you know, USGBC, I think, has been very successful in creating a huge network of organizations and people that are all plugged into this green building learning ecosystem. Like all these people get, you know, have to recertify every few years and continue to get professional development credit through the USGBC platform. Uh, I think we've done some regressions that show that, you know, lead certified uh, contractors are far more likely to see the value in, or at least believe there's value in green technology, that sort of stuff. Um, uh, so lot, lots of networks here, lots of participants in these pilot projects. These are all, uh, so we have both public NGO and private sector involvement. These are all organizations that have done a lead pilot project. And what we see is that, you know, multi-location firms organize, uh, and organizations transfer knowledge. So if you have a Starbucks that gets lead platinum in one location, they're more likely to build lead platinum in another location. Uh, and so we think that USGBC disseminates this knowledge of environmental technologies through through these firms and through these partners. Um, and so we're looking in these graphs at, at a map of commercial lead commercial interiors. Uh, you have diffusion from pilot projects in red, and then diffusion from uh, regular projects in blue. Uh, and we see certainly earlier movement, maybe by definition, uh, from uh, the pilot projects, but we're seeing more diffusion in, in these multi-location firms from participants in these pilot projects. What are you actually measuring in those tracks? Uh, so if you built a lead building in one location and then you do a building in another location, that's... Same organization. Same organization. Same sponsor. Yeah, same sponsor. Starbucks actually did a lead building? I believe. So. I, I don't know for sure, but I'm sure. <laughs> well, I mean, one interesting example question. was like, um, yes, I, yeah, they're in the, yeah, uh, not only the uh, lead building, a lead pilot project. I went to uh, USGBC conference, uh, Green Build. I was, I was talking with a woman who worked for Tiffany's, and Tiffany's is building all of their stores to be lead platinum maybe to cover up for maybe some of the other issues associated with uh, diamonds, right? Uh, the other thing that we found is that the market momentum is cumulative. So one hypothesis might be that, you know, you reach market saturation and sort of green demand market for like lead platinum office space dries up. We don't see that. We actually see that more green building certified or green, uh, lead certified office space begets more lead certified office space. And so it, it sort of builds on itself. And that would support this story of building supply chains, bringing down costs, transforming the market. Driver number four, uh, we think is a supportive policy context. Uh, so, you know, across, you know, we don't have, actually we do have a de facto national green building policy. 
uh, we require through the GSA that we procure uh, real estate that is sustainable. How is this sustainable defined? It's defined through LEED certification. So it's sort of a de facto US uh, green building policy. Uh, in addition, you have a bunch of states, counties, cities that have a range of types of policies that provide either soft or financial incentives to building green. Maybe you get a uh, square footage bonus on your zoning, or maybe you get a, a property tax abatement or something like that. Uh, and so even before the U.S. adopted these federal green building standards, you had 70 percent of the United States lived in an area that had some form of green building incentive. Uh, and not as much research we've done, but others have shown that when you have public sector green buildings, there's spill over to the to the private sector. So bringing this back to this valley of death uh, and how we think about how we might bridge that valley. So recall we had our D spending and policies uh, at the front end, and then we have our promising technologies. And so maybe we can think about using pilot and demonstrations for that the first stage of getting a few uh, products out into the marketplace and demonstrating their effectiveness. And then maybe we can use eco labels to help the private sector th and public sector think about you know, being early adopters and spurring a race to the top and getting private market competition uh, to, you know, right now I think there's a competition within stadiums, right? I opened with the, with the um, Mercedes-Benz, but you know, most stadiums that are being built now are being built to lead gold or lead platinum. Uh, and I think you have this sort of competition in, the sp in sports that's translating to competition amongst owners to have the greenest building. Uh, and so using these eco labels to uh, and, and uh, pri you know, NGO based certifications to spur competition uh, to be green. What's an example of eco label? So LEED is an eco label. Oh, right. What are others? Uh, MSC, like seafood certification or um, uh, there's a couple forestry products, one FSC, right? Uh, SFI would be the maybe weaker industry driven one. I've only heard of LEED. No. You've heard of FSC, no? And <laughs> no. SFI, you're a biologist. <laughs> yeah, but isn't that weird that it doesn't have uh, the tip of mind? I don't if there's any on. package of paper here, it's either going to say FSC or SFI on okay. it. I'll look for it. Yeah. Uh, you'll start seeing them around. Uh, your coffee, you know, fair trade. Yeah. Uh, Rainforest Alliance. Um, we, uh, we actually, in the book, have yeah, a thing on those. coffee yeah. and ag, la ag labels. Uh, san uh, there's also for sugar, there's, uh, there's labels for sugar. So lots and lots of products. And so in there, we do talk about, you know, the generalizability of this to other products and where it falls short and... Uh, I do think it probably needs to be more consumer facing products uh, to get that market premium. Anyway, so we have eco labels and then maybe we can rely on procurement policies. So uh, green purchasing programs by states, by the federal government, these have been shown to be effective like Priuses, uh, having uh, cities buy fleets of Priuses or uh, electric vehicles, like having police cars that are electric vehicles to help demonstrate those to the market help give nice large contracts to uh, producers to build supply chains, you can use the military to do this. Uh, so there's a lot of thought about using the military to you know, build microgrids, improve those technologies and build economies of scale in that space. Why? Because, well, we have a really high willingness to pay to avoid having to, I don't know, fly jet fuel to uh, war areas. Um, uh, and then, you know, you use these to help move the market to where these subsidies and market based policies can then have that marginal uh, that effect on the margin. Right. Um, so we might think about how we apply these to climate change planning and policy. 
Uh, so a lot of y'all are probably familiar with Drawdown Georgia. I've probably heard about that a lot around here. Uh, and so how we think about using specific policy tools to move new technologies to the marketplace. I just saw Maryland sent out something today wanting to know, uh, wanting somebody to evaluate the new electric vehicle or electric bike subsidy that the city is implementing and how is that going to uh, impl uh, affect um, CO2 emissions. So we can start thinking about how we combine different policy tools. If you think about the policy evaluation space, we usually only evaluate one policy at a time. And in the real messy world, we have lots of different policies that interact and have temporal effects. And so how do we think about moving to a system where we have the ability to evaluate or think about the effects of multiple types of policy tools that interact and have cumulative effect? What's CO2E? Uh, carbon dioxide equivalent, right? So like methane is a CO2, is a greenhouse gas that has a, what, CO2E equivalent of what, 42 or something like that? So uh, a key insight from Lynn Ostrom is that, you know, when we're trying to address climate change, we're unlikely to get some sort of magical global government that's going to put a tax or a cap and trade system in place that we've seen the failure of Kyoto. Uh, and so climate change will be best addressed through what she calls a polycentric approach. So thinking about lots of different governance levels that acknowledges local governance, local benefits, focuses on local communities, uh, and then how individuals and institutions can uh, play, play a role. Um, and so, you know, post Paris, we're moving to this polycentric approach, right? We have commitments from companies, commitments from cities and from states and from subnational units. And so how do we think about, you know, climate change policy from this polycentric space where we have lots of different policy tools going at the same time and lots of different approaches? Um, the other sort of thing, you know, I, I was mentioning having an issue with thinking about policy evaluation. Economics as a discipline has had a really difficult time thinking about how we think about the effect of the treated on the untreated, right? So most of our policy evaluation tools from economics are thinking about the average treatment effect, the effect of the treatment on the treated. But in a real messy world where there's learning that spills over outside of the treatment, where we see what our neighbors are doing, where we have changing norms and learning going on throughout an ecosystem, our statistical tools are not well equipped to, to, to do this. Um, so, you know, thinking about future research questions, uh, we're not gonna just adopt price incentives and we've had a really hard time adopting price incentives in the US, though we've been pretty good at subsidies. Uh, we're going to need information policies and procurement policies and ways to incentivize pilot and demonstration projects and ways for the private sector to team up and uh, think about learning. And we might want to think about how these policies interact. Is there an order that we should be pulling these different policy levers? How do policy tools interact within different policy and institutional contexts? And how hard do we pull which levers and in which order? Uh, and so that's all. Happy to take questions, discussion. Thanks, Dan. Um, we'll, we'll take questions online as well. Um, if you want to just raise your hand or, or put them in the chat, I think there is. What's an example of a policy lever? Uh, so we think about like a policy tool. So a subsidy is a policy tool, a tax is a policy tool or lever. Okay. You know, I'm thinking about imagining you just have all these choices of tools and you can sort of pull on a tool and you can pull a little bit hard or really hard. Yeah. Right. And you can pull it first or you can pull it third. Right. And so you have you know, just thinking about, all right, we have regulations, we have taxes, we have incentives, we have R&D funding, we have public procurement policies, we have information policies. And like, you know, econ is focused a lot on the market based ones. 
I think increasingly we're seeing more focus on information mm -hmm. and how we think about information. This, I think, falls into that bin. Uh, very few people have focused on pilot and demonstrations in the past. Uh, we're really one of the first to, to do that. Uh, so, but there, there's more and there's not a lot of papers on public procurement. Uh, there's virtually no papers on, say, the impact of loan subsidies. And that was a big tool we pulled during the Recovery Act. We provided loan guarantees to Tesla and to Solyndra. <laughs> uh, so, you know, uh, but it'd be, I, I've advocated for PhD students to go study the impact of ARA on green tech adoption and what, what happened when we incentivized a lot of market development through loan subsidies and, uh, and, and that sort of thing, or guaranteed loans. We have um, another innovative tool that has gotten a little bit of attention is uh, like uh, ARPA-E, right? These uh, competitions, -E. yeah. right? So uh, innovation competitions, that kind of thing. So that's kind of a new way of, of thinking about incentivizing innovation. Yeah, you mentioned about the college interaction, and I was curious whether you see some variation across the region where there's like a carbon regulation, you see high adoption of lead certificates, something like that. Uh, I haven't done that analysis directly. We definitely see, I think we had in at least one paper we did, we showed that, you know, higher water prices led to more water, uh, water points, right? You're more likely to invest in uh, water efficiency if you face, if you're in an area that has higher water prices. Uh, our data was only from the U.S. Um, I don't recall, I would certainly expect there to be more energy efficiency if there was higher energy prices. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, if you have market incentives like, say, a carbon tax or a cap and trade incentive, I would certainly expect there to be far more investment in energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't have that. It's almost kind of like a too boring question to, to, uh, uh, that people probably don't test because it's, it's too obvious. So, so one uh, thing that, you know, so I reviewed a paper and it's in print. Uh, there's very little information on costs of specific building upgrades. It's all private information. It's also the stuff, even if you build a building, it's not like they bill you for the insulation separately. Um, so it's very difficult to know what sort of the marginal cost is or the marginal benefit is of specific energy improvements. Side note, my, my cousin is working, he's a developer, works for a developer, and he's, he was working on the Disney headquarters, which wants to be a lead platinum building. And he was trying to figure out what the marginal cost and benefit of each additional, you know, sort of improvement to, to you know, what, which improvement should they be investing in? And actually there's a, an HBS case study that I teach in my class on the Genzyme headquarters, which was one of the first lead platinum buildings in the US. And they were sort of trying to figure out which, which credits they should be investing in. Uh, but there was some research out of the UK, out of the Bream program, where they got access to a huge database of buildings and the types of improvements made to those buildings. And they showed that a lot of the costs were not from the technologies themselves, but were from the design costs. The sort of doing something new and innovative uh, drives up a lot of the costs. And you certainly, I mean, the lead, the Candida building, where we do have some good information, at least on total cost, is something like $580 a square foot, something thereabouts. Uh, the previous living building that was built in uh, Seattle that we sort of use the same team. That one was $1,200 a square foot. Typical academic construction is around $250 a square foot. So we're still at like, you know, a multiple of what, you know, traditional construction would take. But a lot of those costs are uh, the increased cost of design, a lot of the finishing costs, because uh, tend to make these buildings nicer because they're kind of fancy. Uh, I would expect that something like Candida also had 
a fair bit of cost into the energy and water systems that was atypical, right? And did I have a, a little bit more information because I teach in that building and we tour it every year. They said that eventually it was 15% more to do the construction. Planning took like double the amount of time. Yeah, so the design part. So the design yeah. part takes a lot of time and it is very slow because it had many constraints such as source locally. So they did not know which material they would be able to buy and which would be sourced locally. Yeah, and the other thing they had to do was, uh, and this is another good example of market transformation, was they had to adhere to this materials red list. Yes. So there were a lot of materials that you would typically use that were prohibited uh, by the red list, such as PVC pipes. Uh, and um, so you had to, a like they had to like create a database of all the different materials and like construction materials and which ones would comply or not comply with the red list. So this is actually a public good. And this is a really good example of, well, now that list has been created, you don't have to do it again. Right. And then I think a lot of that is open source. So here's sort of a kind like this is something that should lower the cost for future adopters. The second thing, another kind of good anecdote out of that is this. So the, uh, it was the electric company, electric installers, Eckhart, I think, electric that did the uh, electric conduit. And typically they would have used PVC. And so they had to use HDPE for this purpose. And I've seen a panel and talk to this guy and um, he's like, man, I just didn't know how dangerous PVC was. I didn't know about the toxic emissions uh, created during uh, production. I didn't know about how dangerous it is if it catches on fire and like, cause it emits chlorine. Um, and you know, so for the first time for this building, uh, we had to use HDPE piping and uh, you know, it turns out it was kind of easier to do. Uh, easier than I expected. And uh, we're going to do that from now on. Right. And so there's like a really micro example of, you know, one contractor brought into this project. And what the other interesting thing about that project is because it's a public project, uh, it had open bid for contractors. Right. And so you didn't necessarily select green contractors to work on this. You selected, you know, the lowest cost contractors to work on this. Uh, mm -hmm. And so they ended up, you know, getting these, you know, contractors involved that maybe hadn't done uh, a green building before and had to change their ways and learn as part of the process. The initial grant proposal that I talked about before this all started uh, that was funded and then unfunded. Um, <laughs> and we were going to look at sort of the network of contractors and how they like what happens you know, it's been what five years since Candido was built. What happens now? Have they gone on to change change their practices? Are they disseminating green practices throughout uh, the region? Uh, we did collect some data on a small um, like IAC grant five years ago. We should probably go back and follow up on this work. Another good example from the topic I, I brought up: uh, chilled beam HVAC. Yeah. Uh, chilled beam HVAC is where you run like a cool pipe uh, up in the ceiling and then blow like a fan over it. And that's a, ra a way to do radiant cooling or heating, which is more energy efficient than using a compressor. And I guess this has been common in Europe and in Australia. And then I guess Furman University uh, did one building like this. And Howard Wertheimer, I guess, learned about this at a conference. And they did at Georgia Tech, I think the first building to use this was, I think they did a lab or just like a very small part of Clough. Then they did it in like half of IBB. Then they did it in the new library. And now I think it's in maybe the Anthem headquarters mm -hmm. and CODA. And so it's like disseminating and it's, I think disseminating largely as a result of Georgia Tech. Uh, and so I thought that was kind of a cool sort of technology innovation and diffusion story. And it was seen as a very risky technology. Uh, you've probably heard the stories of, yeah, what happens if you put radiant cooling in cement floors in Candida? 
and uh, it turns out you get condensation and, you know, it could become very slippery and they have a really big problem. That didn't happen, right? It seems to be working pretty well, but it was seen as a pretty big risk when they built Candida. And I did hear that Coda did have some problems with condensation and dripping uh, mm -hmm. early on. I think they fixed it. There's some other technology called a DOAS, a dedicated outdoor air system. I've learned way too much about uh, <laughs> building technologies as a result of this. But uh, apparently a DOAS is really important to keep um, sort of air dehumidified in, uh, in these buildings when you're using radiant uh, heating and cooling. You don't have it in this building. See? No. <laughs> Did you see any evidence that a pilot or a demonstration project maybe had the opposite intended effect that it it either costs so much or it performs so poorly that it then people were afraid to adopt it in the future. I, and I'm thinking like the new nuclear reactors in Georgia. You know, they were yeah. promised to be built. Yeah. They were going to do all kinds of wonderful thing at lower cost, and they're coming in at a much higher cost, way behind schedule. And it seems like there's not going to be this nuclear renaissance in in the U.S. because of that person. Um, so, I mean, there's definitely a book to be written here. Uh, I've done a lot of thinking about this. So, so one, you know, first point is that you know, even in the green building space, we saw the first quintile of green building pilot projects dissuaded people from repeating it. So you could take the Candida building, maybe it's the first quintile of demonstration projects, and wow, that's expensive. We can't afford to do that, right? Uh, so uh, what we found was that you really need to iterate these. And so when you try to do a one-off project like a nuclear plant or like all of the demonstration nuclear plants at Idaho National Labs, they never get repeated. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of incentives in s &T to being the first, to inventing something new. There's not nearly as many incentives for being the second through 10th, especially when it's not gonna be until the 50th that you actually make it commercially viable. And so you bring up nuclear, how long has hydrogen been the next big thing? Like all of my life, <laughs> uh, or at least since I learned about energy. <laughs> uh, cellulosic ethanol uh, was going to be the next big thing, and it's never happened. Mm. And so I don't know exactly why these things never happened, uh, whether we just didn't put enough money into them. My hypothesis, we didn't repeat them enough that we tried to do a couple of bio, you know, biomass cellulosic ethanol plants and we just needed to do a lot more of it. But there's probably not public appetite to keep throwing money after things that look unpromising. I think what what was unique about the green building space is that these are small enough that you can iterate them. Uh, and so you know, things that get manufactured get cheaper. Things that have to be custom designed get more expensive. Uh, and so nuclear, maybe modular nuclear, if we can manufacture, I mean, it hasn't been going well so far, but maybe modular nuclear, because you can manufacture it, they'll figure it out. Um, but still, the permitting, all that stuff is one off. Those design costs, those upfront costs, really hard to bring them down. They're very labor intensive. Labor gets more expensive over time, not less. So things that are labor intensive tend to get more expensive. Things that can be manufactured be made less expensive. Might have a question online. Scroll down. Oh. Why do you think design is so expensive? Labor intensive. Is it right. labor? All extremely labor. high cost people people are needed to do that so the amount of money that uh, anybody who has a specialized skill claims mm -hmm. is huge compared to a usual architect it's super specialized knowledge but that's where dissemination of that knowledge that's what canada wants to say so disseminate that knowledge more teach it more actually like for example and we get more such people who can actually sort of Purpose. Yeah. So the other aspect of it is living buildings 
are difficult to replicate because they're so much specific to the climate, the exact tree canopy, the exact land properties, and this and that. That's okay. Super hard to, you know, but super hard to replicate in other places. That's where there's this interesting problem about can AI do it? Right, and AI can't do this because there are so many aspects that we don't even know of that need to be taken care of. And that's what drives that cost. Up. No, that, that yeah. means you only have to think harder. It's not, it's like when I think manufacturing and all the tools you have, that would really limit it. You can't change those facts. That is you can change how you think fast. If you were to have more people yeah. who are trained in that direction of yeah. thinking completely with blank slate all the time, yeah. yes, we can speed it up. Yeah. yeah, I'm sort of doubtful it's that individual. living buildings will ever take yeah. off take because off. they're yeah. too customized. Yeah, the lead took off, I think, because they made it easy enough to replicate, yeah. right? And yeah. so. You know, some of the more, you know, there's certain parts, you know, and more energy efficient systems, more energy efficient windows, more, you know, things that can be manufactured and just kind of cobbled together. Uh, those things can, I think, disseminate more rapidly. And then there's others, particular aspects of things about the living building challenge that are just a little ridiculous, like the water stuff, like manufacturing your own water on site right like that's not something that we should not necessarily even want other buildings to do uh but one of the ones that's very promising we have a vignette in the book is mass timber uh because in their building that mass timber building on uh north ave uh, candida is part mass timber there's another mass timber building in atlantic station uh and Aside from the CO2 benefits, one of the biggest benefits is you can like manufacture modules off site and then sort of stack them together like Legos. And that actually has the potential to reduce construction time so it can save money. Uh, and so saving, saving money is big. Are these pioneers making money on intellectual property or are they able to then you know, figure it out in the pilot and then sell that? knowledge or capability to others i think licenses? that so no and in fact one of the unique things that george detected as far as candido which i think the architects see as a double-edged sword uh was they required the design plans for the competitors to all be public uh and so that would maybe dissuade people from doing or participating so, so shouldn't that ju then drive down the design costs for the future, potentially. Yeah, because but they don't have licensing ability or even intellectual property at that point. Now, I think there's a lot more to building a building than seeing somebody else's sketches, right? I'm not an architect, but uh, so I think the, the participants did this for bragging rights, for the, you know, we know how to do this. And they, I think, learned quite a bit through this process. And even if you talk to them now, there's like, things that they would do very differently. And there's things that they're like, yeah, this proves to be a model of how we want to do this again and again. Uh, I think the energy systems have way overperformed, although I, I heard a secret that the reason that we're so over our energy budget is because we never put a coffee shop in there. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I know the uh, opposite, actually, that the reason we there isn't a coffee shop there is because it would have killed the energy budget. Mm. I think they ruled out an espresso machine, maybe. Mm. I'm not sure. <laughs> Apparently espresso machines are very energy. Very energy. Mm. But we're like 40%, I think it pr produces uh, about net 40% more than it consumes right now. You mean making the steam to go through the... Yeah, they do some like That's calculation on what our... Uh, pressure. Um, what what the sort of consumption would have been, you know, incorporating the district heating plants, right? But that is another sort of one-off thing that, well, most buildings aren't on a district heating plant, right? Mm -hmm. Wow, I gotta stop drinking espressos. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are over our time and we're running into our reception time or, or 
social period. So uh, let's let's convene this or uh, reconvene back outside uh, for drinks and sweets and continue the conversation. Mm -hmm.